happening now. We'd like to welcome our viewers from across the United States and around the world. This is the EdTech Situation Room for July the 12th, 2017. And this is Wes Fryer coming to you from Oklahoma City, <clears throat> looking a little more casual than I normally might on a show because who knows, maybe you're going to see this show and you're going to actually hear Jason Neifer speak and you're going to be like, that guy needs to keynote my next conference. And you're going to see me in my hat going, who is that Yahoo? But I am the director of technology at the Cassidy School. Excited for the start of school, but I'm glad to be having about four more weeks before that happens. We don't start until Eclipse Day, which we've been, you know, asked to say, hey, that might not be a good day to start classes. Um, but we are because the Eclipse is not coming right over. So maybe it won't be as big of a deal. So joined as always from hot Missoula, Montana by Jason Neifer, noted Yoda of EdTech and Jedi Master of all things related to the tech world. Well, good evening, Wes. And yes, it's not only hot in Missoula, Montana. Um, we don't really believe in the air conditioning in, in our state. So it's been a, a little rough kind of dealing with the 92, 95, 98 plus temperatures. So uh, Miles City, Montana, which is located in fabulous eastern Montana, is supposed to be uh, 99, 102, 103, 103, 103, 102 starting Friday. So I guess it could be worse is probably the way I'll look at that tonight. Mm. Well, we, uh, we're kind of used to our hot weather. I think it was 105 with the heat index. Um, our son is working the grounds crew uh, for our school uh, and uh, has been doing riding lawnmowers and weed eating. And I think he ran the bobcat. But I, I, I think this is a pretty good summer for him saying this is why, you know, college degree. It, it's made me appreciate my air conditioning a lot. And uh, I think that he perhaps will have a greater appreciation for returning to uh, air conditioned college. And of course, I don't know, he's in Golden, Colorado at Colorado School of Mines. And they probably are not, when we lived in Colorado, they weren't super into air conditioning either. So perhaps yeah. global climate change, not to say we're going to get political tonight, but you know what? It may be a good career field for folks to look at if uh, <laughs> you haven't had lots of air conditioner installers. So Jason, what do we do here on the EdTech Situation Room for people who are unfamiliar with us and our format? Well, the EdTech Situation Room is a mostly weekly program where we take a look at the headlines in the technology field and we try to put an EdTech spin on them. Um, all the links uh, from all of our discussions appear at our website, edtechsr.com. There's usually a lot of extra links there. So if you're looking for a good curated list of interesting things to read that may encourage you to think differently about technology or technology in the classroom, it's a great place to go. And it just so happens that we have a major headline that we haven't had an opportunity to dig through yet. But two weeks ago, there was a meeting of the great educational technology minds and fabulous and speaking of hot and humid San Antonio, Texas, where the International Society of Technology Education had their annual conference, the ISTE um, uh, International Conference was there. And both Wes and I were there. We got an opportunity to hang out during the opening keynote. Uh, we had planned on a live broadcast of our show, but couldn't work it out with the tight schedules as such. Um, but I guess I'd start with Wes, anything interesting for you at ISTE product-wise, presentation-wise, people-wise? Well, I do want to respond to that article, which we can get into, but uh, before the show, we were just briefly talking, and uh, this was, I wasn't originally going to go to ISTE, um, and so somehow the planets aligned, and some years I haven't had anything accepted, and ended up uh, getting to do four things, and then having a fifth one come about, so uh, the highlights for me, uh, definitely the poster session, uh, being able to do that with with my wife, and then we collaborated with the art teacher, elementary art teacher at our school, and that was really fun. You know, poster sessions are crazy and just wild with all kinds of people, but just constant sharing. And so we were we did um, a poster session to start off Monday morning on we called it Steam Studio, and on a technical note, this worked out very well. The previous year, we had you know, actually brought different objects to put on the bulletin on the bulletin board for the poster or whatever. And I I saw some people roll out nicely printed, you know, posters that were were the length and width of the entire bulletin board. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. And so inspired, I think primarily by um well uh Tony Vincent has been doing a lot with Google Draw. And then Alice Keeler, I think, I've, I saw her talk, uh, one of her posts, I think it was Alice, uh, for, for Google talking about like Google Classroom doing a, a custom banner or whatever. Anyway, realize that with Google Draw, you can do custom-sized 
layouts and then easily do a collage. And so you can do that in pixels or in inches. And so literally found out, hey, the, the session uh, poster is eight, eight foot by four feet. <clears throat> and our local print shop uh, couldn't print as long as you want, but they only three feet high. And it turned out great. And we had a bunch of QR codes in there and uh, rolled that out. So anyway, that was probably the, the most fun. Um, we I ended up going Sunday to uh, Jackie uh, Gernstein's STEAM workshop. And she had a really neat, in fact, I don't know if I can pull that book out, but it was um, a booklet for circuits. And, the, and they had these sticker circuits. And uh, we've done different kinds of things with LED lights and you know, make, making, you know, basic kinds of like little greeting cards that light up and stuff like that. Um, but it was really neat the way that they had it scaffolded and, and uh, also these stickers and whatnot. So anyway, that was one of my takeaways. We're going to be doing that in the, the little steam studio that we'll do with elementary kids after, um, after school this fall. And uh, then I would probably say, um, you know, just um, in ISTE and the, uh, uh, opportunity really with with Twitter and the things that are are shared and the and the connections because it's you can get a taste of the fire hose during those few days but honestly if you end up following on Twitter people who are sharing and then connecting and adding those people to your network that's kind of the gift that keeps giving uh, so I suppose I probably benefited as much from the digital side of the sharing as I did from the face to face just because I was so busy so how about you you did you stay the whole three days? I did stay the whole three days. Um, and a little insider's tip for folks at ISTE, this is particularly useful in uh, venues that filled super quickly like the Atlanta ISTE a few years ago. But the best way I think to watch the big presentations is find one of the televisions that's popped up around the convention center, pull up a table, plug in your devices to recharge again and watch the keynote from there. Because not only do you have the opportunity to see the keynote, not that the keynotes were very well done again this year. Uh, I think that, that uh, ISTE, does do a good job of trying to balance um, thought leaders, maybe broadly in education or maybe broadly in the humanities with technology folks. Uh, that was no exception this year. I thought the keynotes were really well done, but if you can, you know, you don't have to be in the room, 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 the hot stuffy room to be able to uh, enjoy that. And in fact, you could probably have an ongoing conversation as Wes and I did during the open keynote when we found ourselves in one of those television areas next to plugins and kind of charging our devices. Um, I spend most of my time on the vendor floor. I did have a number of uh, meetings with uh, vendors that, that I work with in the context of my day job and others I was interested in their product. Um, there were a lot of interesting things announced at ISTE as there tends to be um, each year. A lot of VR was, was uh, featured on the floor, which is not a surprise to me. Um, there was a lot of kind of, I, I would call it like hands-on technology. I, I don't really like that term because I think it sometimes gets used to obscure things rather than provide light, but things like um, uh, uh, hardware that was hackable and codable, um, devices that could respond to code. Um, there were a number of robot platforms uh, that are starting to become cheap enough to end up in the education space that were interesting. And then I was looking this year, not necessarily because uh, I have a, a, a budget for this or I'm interested in this, but there were a lot of, of of furniture vendors there this year. I felt like more than usual. Usually there's at least one or two there. And, and I happen to spend a lot of time in the Steelcase booth because I like the work that they do. It's it's premiumly priced stuff, but they have this really cool pod that I would love to get for my office. I can kind of close myself in it and get my work done. But it was a beautiful um, kind of internal pod that you could sit and put your feet up on an ottoman and there was plugins and a little pull down laptop table. And I'm not a, a svelte guy. I'm a you know kind of round-ish, and I fit perfectly in this. And it looked like it was designed for middle school kids, right? But beautiful um, uh, new furniture options there too for schools that are looking to create creative and flexible spaces for the purposes of, of kind of redesigning what school space looks like. So lots of interesting things there. And of course, the conversations at, at ISTE are always really, really, really supreme. You can find people in the hall that you can agree with or argue with. I feel like there is a spirit of disagreement there in a very positive way. Uh, I always like watching. There are some very prominent 
Um, I wouldn't call them trolls, but people that kind of like trolling some of the popular things there. For example, uh, interactive whiteboards took it on the chin on Twitter, as they tend to do um, at, at ISTE each year. And then, of course, you know, there's kind of the conference outside the conference. There were dozens of vendors that held events outside of the main um a conference center. Um, I know that Alice Keeler, for example, the prominent Google advocate in, from California, held coffees each morning. Um, I wasn't quite ready to get up at 4.30 in the morning to go meet her and her crew for that, although I am an early morning creature. Did she seriously do it that early? Yeah, there was a coffee shop and Super AM. She posted a selfie every day of her and the the oh early morning gosh. folk to, to chit chat. I think it was like five thirty or six is when the official start was. But you know, there are some early morning people out there in the world. But wonderful conference. And you know, I used to be a little intimidated by ISTE and felt that it was a little too much. But I think part of the trick to ISTE is making it your own, right? Like you don't have to go to every workshop. You don't have to visit every vendor booth. You don't even really have to go to, to uh, the conference part itself. You could get away with a vendor floor pass and still be part of tons of conversations. But I think it's a, it's a critical, uh, critical connection point for folks. Um, but the article I posted in tonight's notes, and again, these notes are available at our website, edtechsr.com, um, and I was really interested in this for a couple of different reasons, but Ed Surge on July 4th published, um, Tired Ed Tech Trends That Teachers Wish Would Retire from the Floor of ISTE 2017. Very interesting um, piece there, and there it is accompanied by a 20-minute uh, audio clip of, of, of talking to various folks. The two things that were really interesting about this. The first one is that um, the people they quoted in their article are not actively in classrooms anymore. And these are four thought leaders. And I don't want that to take away from them because I think what they say is mostly correct. And that's kind of what I want to talk about for a minute is some of the things they noted that were tired discussion points. But I would be really curious to hear from some active classroom teachers that attended the conference. What's to what's what's being beat on you too much that doesn't make much sense. And then also, I do think that part of the problem with any ed tech conference is that you have kind of, you know, the nerds there, and that includes certainly uh, Dr. Fryer and myself, but also, you know, the wonderful keynotes there this year, but these are these are the, the future looking leaders that, you know, don't really need the, you know, 10 plugins for, for, for Chrome that are going to change your experience, right? Because they're the ones that are stumbling onto these and apply them to education. And I do think that for the you know, the, I, I'm going to use the word average, even though it's not that illustrative here, average teacher, or maybe the first time teacher, or maybe a teacher that says, you know, I've been kind of you know, eschewing the tech to this point, and I want to you know be emerged in that. Um, you know what what their perception of it was. So, um, any other trend, Wes, that you found interesting at the conference? Well, I'll respond to that article, and I I honestly yeah, uh, I honestly really disagree with from just where I sit in Oklahoma with with things that they were saying because you know they said they can't stand the the term personalized learning. Uh, man, it's just so essential. We still have all kinds of what feels like very production line standardized approaches, you know, in, in public ed. And when I, when I see uh, the power of adaptive apps and uh, curriculum that can be customized to students anyway, I think that's a great thing to talk about is, is personalized learning. Uh, one of them talked about professional development. They're sick of that. I'm at a school that doesn't really have a great schedule for building in professional development on a regular basis. You know, we are working on that and we're probably, uh, you know, maybe two years, maybe a year away from a block schedule. Uh, but I think we've had our same schedule for close to 50 years. And, you know, every, every class, every day in the high school kind of thing. And so um, professional development is essential. You know, I'm about to, to – uh, publish just here in the next four weeks as we gear up for school, you know, a few different sessions. I'd, I'd love to do more. It's just, it's very challenging. They, they said QR codes they were sick of. Oh my gosh, I love QR codes. You know, that's, if you're, if you want people to quickly be able to get to a resource, uh, I think that person said, you, you know, you didn't just, just need a QR code. And I totally agree, you know, put your shortened web link right underneath it. But 
as a percentage, a, f a relatively few number of people are, are using QR codes. Um, and since we're mentioning it, I'll, I'll uh, shout out to one of the articles that we have under the iOS Apple category tonight, uh, Mac Rumors, June 6th, iPhone can scan QR codes directly in the camera app in iOS 11. So the new version of iOS, which has come out on um, the the developer channel if if folks are you know the early adopters and the developers that will be coming to us this fall and you know that's going to help that go mainstream the the more you know apple integrates things as core features but anyway i i didn't uh i didn't really resonate with with what they were saying in the hello <laughs> Sorry, I neglected to announce to my family that I was starting the stream and we had two people doing Netflix streams and that is evidently not compatible with the Hangout. So I apologize yeah. for my dropout. That's, I thought it was me there for a second. I was like, what happened? Come on, Chromebook. So he's being passionate and he's being ejected from the chat. So, um, okay. So jumping back in, I would say that the reason why that, <laughs> that article resonated with me um, and there was there was there the one in particular actually the two in particular that I think uh, didn't resonate with me was um, uh, Jeannie Majira who has actually been on an early machination of the show um, when we used to do it as a yearly review a couple of years ago but I do agree with her that the term blended learning is way too vague to uh, I think it's used in way too uh, vague of a way. And I think that the conversation about blended learning at ISTE is the same conversation that happens every year with blended learning at INACAL, which is the virtual schooling symposium um, that uh, uh, I've attended many, many times as part of my day job at, at the state virtual school in Montana. And like people can't define really what blended learning is in a way that it's easy to shoot things towards it so we can talk about app advocate for blended learning in the United States. Um, I'm not going to mention the organization because this is going to paint uh, them in a totally positive light. But a couple of years ago, um, I was contacted because uh, they wanted to put our credit recovery program at Montana Digital Academy um, as part of their blended learning directory. And I said, well, this is not a blended learning environment. It's an online learning environment and there is no blended learning um, as part of the process. Said, oh no, it's a blended learning environment. And I explained it to them. I said, oh no, that's a blended learning environment. So I went to their website and copied and pasted their definition of blended learning into the email and said, no, 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 no. Like we don't do this, we don't do this, we don't do this. And I am kind of the grouchy guy at INACAL every year that says I'd really love someone to give me a clear definition of blended learning and it, it turns into a Twitter thing every year and then they start fighting with each other like oh blended learning is really easy this is the definition and then they start fighting with one another are, are people just seeing blended learning as technology integration it's just so so wide and big or what's that's exactly the point right that if you have kids if you have one-to-one -one iPads in your classroom and you're really not um, kind of moving away from learning objects, then that's that's more or less a, 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 a ed tech integration, right? Old school ed tech integration at that. And if you're standing in front of your students telling them to go to this, this, and that as kind of a, a, a teacher guided web quest, in my mind, that's not blended learning either. Now, it doesn't have to be, you know, like we're going to meet for two hours a week and I'm going to kick you out of my room so you could do online learning stuff. Like, I think there's great nuanced ways to do that. But there's a lot of people that run around and talk about that blended learning can do this, this, and that. And I think to myself, that's just good ed tech integration, right? And so that that's the complication there. And that term, I think it's used uh, like a little too much. And then I do want to pick on the term personalized learning for a second. And it's not that personalized learning isn't great. It's actually where we should be with, with just about everything, right? I mean, part of my day job at the Montana Digital Academy is to administer the EdReady Montana program. And for those of you unaware of, of EdReady, it's a tool that was created by the NROC Project, which is a California nonprofit that's worked on, on technology integration for, for oh, I think, nearly two decades now, I think, um, but for a long, long time. And it, it's a personalized method 
mathematics uh, learning tool. It's amazing, right? Because it, it helps kids to kind of get off on the important scope and sequence of mathematics, oftentimes to their, their peril in future math courses. It helps them fill in those gaps by testing those students on what they're weak on and delivering instruction on what they're weak on, right? Which is a, you know, it seems very simple, but very few tools actually do that in the ed tech space, even those that advertise themselves as personalized learning tools. I always question when I hear blended learning, I'm sorry, personalized learning, now I'm getting my own buzzwords. Um, it's personalized based on what, right? And I think that's the question that doesn't get asked enough that if you're personalizing based on something that may not have a real differential to it, right? Then you're kind of personalized for personalizing sake, right? Like personalization um, shouldn't be about, and I'll just make uh, my, my regular controversial comment on this, like it shouldn't be based on learning styles because learning styles don't have have a lot of cognitive research that back them, right? And in fact, um, and this I, this is my regular rant, uh, Daniel Willingham in his book, Why Don't Students Like School, goes into this in some detail. But, you know, I think that even Howard Gardner would agree that if you're adopting weird lines to, to personalize things based on non-existent styles, right, or differentials that don't really exist between students, then you're, you're really not doing anything to improve the education. You're kind of doing choice for choice sake, which I don't think has a lot of pedagogical defense for it. So I would say that, that you know, and again, what, what the smart advanced folks say is buzzword doesn't mean it's a buzzword to everyone because I'm certain there were thousands of attendees that probably got a lot about discussions about personalized learning and, and blended learning at ISTE. But I do think that, that those terms tend to get a little hackneyed if we don't spend time, to, first of all, meaningfully defining them and then making sure that we are, are doing those things for pedagogically defensible reasons. I think it is important to recognize that generally at ISTE and every state level ed tech conference, over half of your attendees every year are new. I, and I don't think that's changed. And yeah. I think I heard Sylvia Martinez say that first. And we do have a different lens when we've been going for years and you are an ed tech uh, nerd and, and, and all that. So um, I, I don't really know that I feel browbeaten too much by by particular terms. I mean, I, I certainly, I don't tend to hang out at the, in the vendor floor much at all. I didn't go in there at all this year. Uh, and, and I think maybe last year I did, did a little bit. Um, this is also the first year I haven't gone to the bloggers lounge, which is, was more of a function of time rather than anything else. Uh, but, um, you know, I, my wife, I've, I have seen Mitch Resnick of MIT, Dr. Resnick, who's the inventor of Scratch with a lifelong kindergarten group present before, uh, but we got to shake hands and get our picture taken with him. That was the, the moment of uh, excitement. Man, I'm going to maybe have to think about a different computer. Uh, it says performance reduced. Closing Google Chrome may help your Mac cool down. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's climate change coming to my Mac. Uh, but uh Shelly and I got to meet briefly with uh, Carl and Angela. Carl's the co-founder of, of Seesaw, and Angela does the, the PD and your PJs. And anyway, those mm -hmm. things those things were highlights. But I don't know that I really feel feel browbeaten too much. Digital natives was for a while, right? Everyone was talking yeah. about digital natives, and you were sick of that. There are no digital natives. You know, there's folks that are more navigational in the way they learn and are, right. are more fearless and, and that kind of thing. But, um, uh, I would say the other thing that I got to do that I, I remember, and again, I'm looking forward to the evolution of this. I did go to the Microsoft Experience Room and um, oh. experience their, I just used the word, experience their um, their mixed reality um, uh, headset. Um, it was a little awkward because it hurt my head. Like it was the, the fit, the fit was all wrong and there wasn't a lot of time. I mean, there, there was a technician on hand to help adjust it and it wasn't super great, uh, uh, a fit. And so it, it physically hurt, you know, my skull, but, um, in, and the demo was, you know, it, the, we got to get some, some people thinking about how mixed reality and virtual reality works in the context of a, of a real classroom. The, um, I believe they brought in Pearson and uh, that Pearson was the content partner and they had four tables where they had four 
um, interesting pieces of antiquity there that you could kind of walk around the table and see a 360 degree view of. And that was cool. But, you know, in my mind that that that's a great use of, of, of VR to see something in, in, in 360 degree kind of three dimensional nature like that. But there wasn't a lot of the, 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 the kind of model teacher they had on hand didn't really know anything about the four cultures that the piece was from. And of course, as a former social studies teacher, you know, like, I'm like, this is a huge missed opportunity. Bring someone in that's a very persuasive, knowledgeable person in those pieces, and suddenly it becomes more interesting when, you know, if you have a blank table in the middle of the room and you can, you know, automatically pop up a 360 degree view of an object and then start to tell and engage in stories and, and, and do what I think is important in a history class, which is to focus on the narrative, that suddenly is very powerful. But super interesting, early days on that tech, and, and there was good stuff. And I did go to the other stations um, in the Microsoft experience room and they were talking about mystery Skypes, which are, you know, pretty cool. And uh, they had one of those gigantic surface boards, the really massive uh, touchable monitors. And I had never, I mean, I've seen one, but I've never actually touched one. And so playing around with that was super interesting, uh, really nice piece of hardware. And then they we're also doing a lot with Minecraft, obviously there. So that was the other, other opportunity I had there uh, to, to physically touch some stuff that was pretty great. Uh, there was also a lot of drones on the floor um, that uh, probably relatively limited applicability in schools, not completely, but um, interesting. There was a lot of those. Um, and, you know, the usual, you know, there's 25 case vendors there that want to sell you something that is going to make a, a delicate iPad key proof. And it's like, well, yeah, but, you know, there's only there's only so much power you could put around an iPad before it becomes less functional, but certainly interesting. And I would say that uh, the other thing that's that's maybe a, a, a side note is that um, I've been to a couple of conferences in San Antonio before. This was the first time they had the new wing of the San Antonio Convention Center open. Oh my gosh, that was nice. Beautiful. Like, what a great venue. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can't say I would go and hang out on the Riverwalk as a tourist, um, that wouldn't be my my kind of destination, but it is such a wonderful place to have a conference. There's restaurants everywhere. It's easy to get back and forth from hotels. Um, it's it's pretty great. So your mentioning of uh, of uh, virtual reality reminds me of augmented reality. I think I I did not see that a lot. I, maybe, I'm sure there were those sessions. That's something I've seen that is just not that impressive to me. It's it a lot of that has seemed like a fancy QR code in terms of ways to get to content. The creation tools haven't been there. It's really a parlor trick that oohs and ahs. And there are, there are some neat things like where you print out that paper cube and then you can combine elements. And, and there there's a few things like that that I've seen. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, and that, that article was interesting too because it was all on the negative, right? So yeah. I don't know. There's, there's definitely a lot of, a lot of positive to, to focus on and talk right. about. Um, anything like, as a major announcement? We did our show last year from, from the floor and there was some – I don't know, big announcements from Google and, and products and things. It, did anything stand out from, for you in terms of uh, a product launch or, or anything that was really an upgrade? You know, I thought there wasn't a lot of a lot of energy around those announcements. And in fact, it feels like that I know there's going to be a lot of new updates to Google Classroom in the fall, but that wasn't announced until last week. Um, Microsoft, uh, and I have, I have a link on that tonight, or maybe I have a link on that tonight, but Microsoft has announced that their Teams platform, which is kind of a Slack um, wannabe is is now integrated in the Microsoft Classroom system, which I think is a, is a clever move on their part. It creates kind of a you know a social space for classrooms uh, that is Slack like, but still kind of under that Microsoft umbrella. That's that's interesting development. I mean, I think part of it is, and maybe where I would sort of agree with the notion that professional development's a tired piece. Like these tools aren't evolving as quickly as they were a couple years ago. Not because there isn't a lot of energy around it. It's because we've created a lot of really great platforms that can enable some some pretty advanced community learning inside of classrooms. So the energy now needs to be great. These are pretty functional tools. How do we use them? Where I would disagree with the speaker there uh, in the article is that. Like, yeah, there's a lot of bad PD out there. Don't get me wrong, right? But, um, you know, if you're putting in some thoughtful time into organizing your PD and also freeing up, um, uh, you know, folks, the opportunity to play with these tools and not just hear about from a speaker how great they are, but, you know, have some quality time, supported quality time where you can sit down and actually you know, tweak them and play with them. I think that's an important piece of this as well. 
And, you know, how many schools today are utilizing different platforms for learning in terms of a learning management system and as far as a yeah. digital portfolio? Um, I dropped a link into the chat for a tour of Seesaw 5.0. And this was something that was actually announced Maybe it was at ISTE or, or immediately right after, but but Seesaw is a learning journal and digital portfolio uh, that my wife has been using for the past, I think, three years. And we really started to use it pretty intensely last year in our elementary level, uh, grades one through four. And we've had some language teachers utilize it, as well as high school science teachers and language teachers and other people that have been dabbling. But really some, some good buy-in for our elementary teachers and I'm very excited about updates. The parent app is the family app. You can connect up to 10 parents. That was one of the best things. It's Seesaw is not as schooly as Google Classroom or a Blackboard or Moodle, a learning management system, which is assignment initiated usually. I mean, you can have discussion boards and things like that. Uh, but it sends text messages to parents and or others, you know, guardians, uh, grandparents, others. So anyway, I'm, I'm excited about those things. And I think you're right. We're seeing the maturity of these platforms. But in terms of the ways they're being utilized in school and how have things become normalized and also not just in an early adapter you know, phase, but you know, how is it something that everyone is utilizing? I really see digital portfolios as one of the most important things we can have as learners to do document our learning, to use media, to show what we know, which is something I love to, to say and talk about. And so... Um, right. You know, and, and Shelly and I helped lead a iPad and iPad media camp up in Jackson, Wyoming, not far from your neck of the woods, Jason, right after ISTE. And, you know, use Seesaw, this is the second summer, to use that in two and a half days, three days, 45 teachers shared almost 400 different media artifacts together, you know, in this class that we had. And it's incredible, right? I mean, it's when, when you have had difficulty getting folks to turn stuff in and to share things. And I've wrestled with that, you know, with YouTube and blogger and posturous and all of these, you know, different kinds of tools, you know, when you find a tool that really facilitates Educational, you know, researcher hat, doctorate hat, you know, what are the statistics now? I'd love Pew or somebody else. I don't know if Pew would do this. a learning management system. You know, how many of our classrooms are one to one? How many are you? Always see things that are on the edge. And that's exciting, but you sometimes don't know whether that's, you know, going to flame out and persist or, or it's going to be a game changer. And I think uh, digital portfolios are something that are going to be here to stay. And also having some, you know, learning management system, which is hopefully robust and facilitates transformative educational communication between, you know, teachers and students and allows for the feedback to be high quality and timely and differentiated and all of that stuff. You know, I, where I sit in Oklahoma, uh, I don't think we're certainly not leading the nation. And I just, I think those statistics would be fairly low for the implementation and, and integration of those kinds of tools. And so um, we're going to, you know, be in a phase where hopefully we can bring those, bring more of those things to students. But, you know, educational funding being as it is, there's all kinds of priorities that are higher than, you know, the technology priorities on the state budget agenda. Okay, well, let me, let me then uh, kind of uh, dance over to a topic we just mentioned, because I think this is kind of cool, and it makes a good demo on um, Microsoft announced today the release of an app called Seeing AI, S E E I N G A I. And there are two remarkable things about this. The first one is they released it initially only to iOS, which is mind blowing to me. If you need what? any evidence 
that Microsoft is a different company than it was five and 10 years ago. It's they released a major new app today, experimental app today. And it, it like I could see going to Android first because they've been really trying to go all in um, on that. But uh, uh, if you want to talk about, you know, things have changed, uh, that that's evidence of that. But seeing AI is, is an augmented reality style application that is pretty interesting because although it's fairly fumbly right now as an early beta, it, it's got a lot of potential. So Wes, um, I, I've installed it on my iPad, so it's probably not that necessarily that visible here, but what I want you to do is I want you to look at look right in the camera there, and I'm going to take a picture of you, and uh, Scene AI has said that a 42-year-old man with red hair, which I think it's getting your hat there, is wearing glasses and looking happy. What? So it has, uh, it's guessed your age, and it's it's a little short, but oh, oh, you're 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 a younger guy, right? So you're younger feeling. So that's it's you're a little older than that, right? Yes. But that's okay. pretty, that's pretty close. Five years. Yeah, it's pretty close, exactly. Um, it did call me a young man earlier today, so who knows how accurate that is? But uh, it, you know, you have a red bill on your hat, so I could I would give it a mistake that it that you have red hair and you're wearing glasses. And you know, I like to think that our hour each week is of some happiness for you. So, um, you know, like that's pretty accurate, right? But it has four modes on it. It has short text, which means that you can put it up to a a short piece of text and it will read it to you out loud. Um, it has document reading where you put it up to a document, it finds the corners of the document, scans it and reads it back to you. It has person um, uh, identification where it attempts to uh, talk about the age, gender, uh, physical characteristics and emotional piece of, of a person. And then a scene which I can't even really figure out what they mean by scene, but basically it's it it uh, uh, you you take a picture and it tries to tell you what is going on in that that piece. And so uh, I have it on right now, and I'm gonna uh, take a picture of this here. So this is it's they, the subtitle is talking camera for the blind. So yep. this is designed for accessibility for those that are blind or visually impaired to be able exactly. to see more into the world, wow, through their device. Yep. And so like as an example of this, I just took a photo of my um, of my Chromebook, uh, which is you know what I'm on tonight, and it said, it gave a, a description of this, that it's a desk with a laptop computer sitting on a table. Um, and you know, that's pretty, pretty legit, right? Like that's a, a, an accurate piece of that. And you know, that's where, you know, augmented reality starts to get relatively interesting. Um, I love, and I can't remember the source software that Google bought from that, but Google translate has a live translation piece now. It's pretty, oh no, what did it say Wes? 41 year old man with gray hair and a beard looking happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Goes on gray west. What will I do? Um, but you are so, looking happy. So, ladies and I gentlemen, am. when you're on ed tech situation room, you're happy. I think Microsoft yeah. has just proven that for all of us. You may have yeah. red hair, but you're going to be happy. <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's interesting uh, 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 moving in that direction. You can imagine for a moment the Hololens, which is Microsoft's augmented reality platform that I tried out at ISTE. If it can start to identify things and be able to put them in context. And, you know, it's obviously really interesting from the standpoint of, you know, like how it can help people that, that can't see. But if it can start to explain more complex things to where it's not just lacking or it's not just if you lack vision, but if you lack the ability to understand something or context or as I would always see it, I'm looking forward to the day that augmented reality I can look up and, and it's is particularly useful for this. I know a lot of folks that I have relationships with online that I connect with in that way, but you know, I'm not super great with names. So if it could tell me that, right, or, you know, make connections for me like that, that, that can't be far away when it's be able to do that. So I'm pretty impressed with that. I think that's a, so far a pretty fun app to play with. Absolutely. And we've got a section. We, we, we're kind of putting our articles on the show notes, uh, well, not on the, on, the, on the Google Doc, in some categories. So under AI, when I saw Jason put that, I, I dropped a few other links. Um, I really want to commend this podcast. The podcast series is called World Affairs, and it's out of Northern California. And a lot of the things they have are, are politics and 
as a poli sci debate guy and all this, I, I really enjoy listening to some of the amazing speakers they have. But this one is called Technology and the Future of Vision in, of Our Lives in 2050. And it was from back in March um, of 2017. But this is from the editor of The Economist, which is a, a pretty phenomenal magazine. And he's an editor of, of this um, uh, compilation, I guess, of chapters that different people have written about the future. But, you know, he says in here, we as a human species are going to almost be unrecognizable within two to three generations. We are becoming augmented now with our devices and we're going to just become more and more augmented as these devices are not just in our hands and, and pockets and purses, but, you know, are literally built into our bodies with, if you saw Ghost in the Shell, you know, with the blind who are able to not only see in the visual spectrum, but being able to see in other, other wavelengths and, you know, the bio you think about the million dollar man, if you're back in the day, you know, watching those shows, um, we're moving that direction. So that's a phenomenal discussion about AI. There was a conference in the Bay Area back in May about AI, and it was the second year for it. And this article by SmartUp on May 14th was a summary article, and it's titled AI is Eating Software and Getting Smarter by the Second. And <clears throat> one of the, the things, and we'll link this to the educational lens, you know, what do we do right now if you're holding up your crystal ball you know, yes, Microsoft has released Seeing AI. We're in the very toddler first step, even just like still in the crib days of artificial intelligence. But what's happened is we now have, the, thanks to Moore's Law and a lot of other confluence of factors, processing power, hard drive space, connectivity, and bandwidth that is allowing massive amounts of data. I think in that World Affairs article, they say in the last 18 months, more data was created than in the previous sum of human history. I don't think we're getting our heads wrapped around that. And so one of the things they're saying in, in this article on SmartUp is, you know, we need students to be thinking computationally and to be thinking about how to, how to, how to use algorithms and technology to solve problems because this is what we're all going to have greater access to our smart AIs and tools that are going to give us you know more superpowers than we have today. Um, in that World Affairs show he says the interesting thing from a medical standpoint like what's the doctor of the future? Well the doctor of the future is augmented but you're probably going to have people saying can I speak to the computer, please? Uh, you know, and there's going to be ways in which doctors are going to continue to, you know, use judgment and empathy and have roles that are really important that the, the computer is not necessarily going to be able to do as well. But the doctor is not going to be able to have the knowledge of every single study that's ever been done about this condition, every drug interaction that could possibly happen or have been documented, every experimental procedure you know, those kinds of things are going to be accessible. So um, the last thing I put in here was a Harvard Business Review article, and this was from June 19th. And the title is, In the AI Age, Being Smart Will Mean Something Completely Different. And so I think that we need to be challenging our educational leaders, our legislators. We need to think now about what, what this is going to mean. We are within five to 10 years of automation dramatically disrupting truck driving and taxi service and, and, and maybe automobile ownership as we know it because it's just going to become reasonable to, you know, Uber or Lyft or whatever your, your ride, especially if you're in an urban area. And I think, I don't know, it makes me, I would love to have a local conference with some folks talking about AI and these kind of challenging things because we we need to grapple with it. And it's not just a, oh, the computer's here, let's all learn Excel and be able to word process. No, we're talking about data and algorithmic an, you know, analysis of patterns and how we're going to need to work with data and work with these tools in order to solve problems. So I'm really glad for you to point that that app out, Jason. And I I, what what are your thoughts? How what do we need to be doing now, seeing what we're seeing with with AI and the way that these things are going? Or is it too early for us to tell what to do? 
it's probably a little too early, but that doesn't mean we we shouldn't be keeping a close eye on this because the bottom line is is that um, you know there, there's another interesting uh, study I put in the notes this week that's also related to this. And it's basically that uh, UT Austin did a study that basically said when you when 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 you are near your cell phone or it's even in the room, you have less cognitive capability than when the cell phone is in another room or, or, or deep in your bag. And like, I read that, and of course, it goes back to my notion that, you know, you never go all in on anything, right? It's always a balancing act back and forth, right? So, um, you know, we, I, as much as I railed against teachers that banned cell phones, uh, you know, five or six years ago in classes, the answer is the best teachers aren't banning them. They're, they're, you're thoughtfully bringing them in and out and being good instructional leaders to their students when it's appropriate to do so. But when I read that study, I thought both, yeah, the cell phone may have impacts that we're not anticipating, but also it may be that our brains are evolving a little bit, this buffet of information that's available to us. Now, that does not mean that there aren't implications there we need to keep an eye on, but I mean, when apps are available that explain things to you, and I just, by the way, I just took took a picture, a blurry picture of my cat, and Microsoft correctly identified that as Probably a blurry picture of the cat. Okay. <laughs> Wait, Pe Peggy, Peggy has just joined us. So Peggy, if you haven't downloaded Microsoft Seeing AI, that's what Jason and I have been playing with here. And it is, oh my gosh, man. It's early days and we're glimpsing the future right now. Exactly, right. And although Google Glasses were you know, ill-fated because the rollout was kind of weird and they weren't that functional, there's going to be a point in the relatively near future where you will have a camera integrated somewhere around your face that you can utilize to help guess things for you, help identify things, help fill in gaps when you need them. Sure. And I'm not entirely ready yet to say that, you know, it's just only bad. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you may have a blurry picture of a dog now. So, um, the you know, like that's all a piece here that makes things kind of interesting and a little what iffy. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that it's, it's probably a little too early to understand the full implication of this. But man, does it change things when AI plus augmented reality plus miniaturized devices all kind of join together in an alliance of interestingness. And the thought I have is, we see and hear and perhaps do ourselves a lot of hand wringing when we hear these kind of articles about, oh my gosh, the brain is changing. Maybe we need to say, hello, yes it is. Humanity is evolving rapidly and we do need to make choices. I'm sure every family that traveled with, with uh, teen, teenagers and maybe adolescents and I don't, I don't know what age it goes down to has struggled on vacation with and you can be at home doing this too with screens. You know, we went to Yellowstone and the Tetons and there were two days where we had a no, no phone policy and, and it was a great thing. But it, <clears throat> when we were in the cabin uh, that my, my, my aunt and family have, they, they had a satellite connecting to the internet. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're up in the, the mountains of uh, the, the, su the sunlight basin there. And it's even a, as an adult, you know, you have that connectivity, so we are going to connect, and it's 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 important and valuable to be reflective about that and to consider what I'm doing, how I'm using it. But there is no question at in, at all. There shouldn't be that our brains are changing. The connections we're making, the ideas we have, the 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 life of the mind is very different today because of the connections that we have, and we need to you know be balanced and have. Get, you know, digital citizenship conversations, and there's all there's all kinds of conversations to have. But I think my biggest thought about all this is, of course, you know, is the brain changing? Of course. Is humanity evolving? Of course. And uh, some of this feels a little bit like a roller coaster ride that you may not have signed up to be on. But hey, welcome, welcome to the future, as Brad Paisley would say, if anybody's a country music fan. Yep, absolutely. So yeah, very interesting stuff. And it's kind of interesting how all of our, our conversations are weaving together this week. But the bottom line is that that's, the, you know, it's all kind of interrelated. So um, I'd like to take, take us to two just kind of wild articles, if I could, real quick. Sure, please. Uh, 
This is a, an Ars Technica article that was actually during ISTE on June 30th. In attempt to YouTube stardom, woman accidentally kills her boyfriend. Good grief. Uh, these were folks that were trying to crack, I think, 300,000 subscribers on their YouTube channel. And so he was trying to hold up a book that would stop a bullet, and, you know, it didn't. Uh, this there's the the dark side of this isn't you know just extreme things like that but you know it's also kids uh, very much being shaped by likes on Instagram and you know the, there's there's just there's so much going on right now with identity and perceptions of ourself uh, and you know there's there's danger when we're <clears throat> trying to uh, elevate the importance of YouTube stardom. Uh, you know, doing stupid things that can hurt ourselves and hurt others. The other thing, the other article I have in here that's just kind of kind of crazy uh, was a Mashable article from yesterday, July 12th, how a Microsoft font could lead to the removal of Pakistan's prime minister, and it was hashtag fontgate. And so basically there was a uh, Microsoft Word document that was created which um, was by the daughter of the, the prime minister of Pakistan. And so the documents were alleg allegedly forged. And how did they prove they were forged? Well, she used the Microsoft Calibri font, which wasn't publicly available until 2007. And she claimed the documents were created in 2006. <laughs> and so there's some interesting elements to this about the ways in which we leave a footprint, the ways in which, you know, things are embedded in documents that we have. And um, anyway, I thought, I thought that was a, was a pretty interesting article because, you know, even when you make a PDF file, a lot of people don't realize, you know, it'll have creator there and, and date and things like that. Um, and so anyway, any thoughts about those? Those articles, Jason. No, that is pretty interesting, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I say this a lot in context of my day job because you know people don't realize things like you know things are logged, and you actually leave a lot of evidence behind when you utilize a computer, and yada yada yada. But uh, just remember, your computer is probably keeping track of you, not in necessarily creepy ways, uh, like you know the way maybe other technologies are tracking you, but you know there's a fingerprint there, so be aware. Well, and in Europe, they're requiring ISPs to keep uh, the web history of every single person, I think, up for 10 years. And, you know, we're moving into that that arena. So, um, And, Wes, I, I have a proposal for you. I think we need to spend an extended time on net neutrality. Um, I don't think we've okay. talked about it much in the program. Um, I would encourage folks maybe next week or the week after we can take on net neutrality in some kind of detailed discussion. But I would encourage you folks today, and there's a, 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 a decent article that I've posted today, and there's other things probably on both Wes and I's Twitter feed to talk about in more detail. But if you don't understand what the, the big hubbub is about net neutrality, it, it's important to learn. Um, I would argue to you, and we could do this in a more detailed way later, that it would really harm education more than a lot of other industries um, if we lose net neutrality. So uh, inform yourself, learn more about it. Absolutely. Well, you want to take it on next week? We'll just we'll do a net neutrality show? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think it's a great idea. It sounds good. Um, I'll mention that there, um, let's see. Uh, this is pretty big in, in terms of uh, Google Drive. Um, this was 9 to 5 Google on July 12th. Combined Google Drive and Photos backup and sync app available for Mac and Windows, but not available yet for, for G Suite uh, and uh, Google, Google Apps for Education users. So one of the things we've been rolling out this summer are uh, laptop refreshes for our, <coughs> pardon me, our elementary teachers. And in addition to helping them get set up with two-step verification on their Google account, starting to use a password manager, LastPass, if they're not using something else, uh, we've helped them get the Google Drive app installed so that they could be having offline backups um, of, uh, well, really online backups of their documents and, and be able to use the Google Drive folder really as their documents folder because if they put anything in there, it's going to automatically sync. Well, that I, appears to not be available for download now, it, but it's going to be later in the fall that they're going to um, have this, uh, I think it's called Drive Stream is the one that will be for G Suite users. Uh, but they're integrating the backup of both photos and uh, Google Drive documents. So anyway, uh, a, 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 an important thing from Google, and um, we're certainly the beneficiaries of that cloud storage 
and being able to have that as a backup option for folks if they're not going to do time machine or, you know, flash drive or something else, just, you know, trying to change routines and have everything backed up in the cloud. And maybe you mentioned this, Wes, but I know that there was some some chat back and forth about what hardware platform you'd go with, but what did you guys decide on for your refresh? So we went with the MacBook Air. The MacBook Pro um, was, is just too expensive, and it has more horses than that our teachers really need. Uh, we did look at and, and propose a model where um, we, we floated a model where there could be uh, – a Chromebook and an, and an iPad because that could even be cheaper than what we were looking at with a MacBook, depending on you know pricing and models. Um, but there wasn't really much enthusiasm for that. Uh, our our users are over ninety percent Mac and you know fairly comfortable at this point with the the platform. And uh, the model that I'm I'm using now, the uh, A7 I think processor MacBook is um, just, it doesn't have enough ports. You know, our teachers need to be able to, to plug in a USB flash drive and uh, we also need to be able to secure the device. That was also another puzzle because the security port on the um, Mac laptops has for some reason just gone away on all models. Um, but there is a Kensington docking station. It's not really a docking station, it's a security station. So it slides in and then you have a security lock that you can put on that. So anyway, the feedback has been, Pretty positive, and uh, uh, I'll I'll say this, and uh, this is this is exciting news. I I haven't I don't this hasn't been tweeted publicly, but uh, my wife has just taken a new job, and she's going to be uh, teaching third grade at our school, and so she's been four years downtown at a school called Positive Tomorrow's, and so excited about that. And she uh, joining our our lower division, our elementary teachers, uh, just got her new MacBook today. So um, that was pretty exciting and sat down with one of our IT staff and learned a bunch of things about the Mac. And so she's actually moving from the Chromebook to uh, the MacBook. So that's, that's how we went. Awesome. And then I'd mentioned one other thing that uh, probably won't be great in a couple of weeks. So I'll just mention it now. The early reviews of the New Microsoft um, Surface laptops are out, which features Windows 10 S, which is the kind of Chromebook competitor for Microsoft. Um, early reviews are that the hardware is awesome, but most people that reviewed it played with Windows 10 S and then immediately installed Windows 10 Pro, um, you're figuring out that they preferred the, the grander operating system. So I am working on trying to get access to a Windows 10 S device. I, I love Chromebook. Chromebooks are super great. I'm on one right now. It's my primary device when I'm not sitting at sitting at a at a desk somewhere. Um, in fact, this year the uh, I've the last three trips I've went on for work, I brought only a Chromebook with me, and that's new for me. Usually, Chromebook was in addition to a Mac or a, a PC device, and now I'm I'm traveling only with Chromebook and find it to be more than acceptable. But, um, you know, check out those early reviews. I think there's interesting pieces uh, for your consideration. And I guess we could just mention these quickly under the security note. Um, there's an Ars Technica article from the end of June, June 28th, saying Tuesday's massive ransomware outbreak was, in fact, something much worse. And that outbreak was not ransomware. It was actually, I don't know if this is the right term, but wipeware. You know, it was stuff that actually just wiped out people's machines and, and drives. So back up your stuff, people, if you're not. Um, a, f a favorite podcast of mine uh, for tech is the Clockwise podcast. And... Uh, they are recommending Backblaze as a platform for, for backups. I'm uh, currently not – I'm doing Google Drive and then a local, uh, a local backup with Time Machine, but um, that, that bears emphasizing. And then there's a BBC News article from July 10th saying why you should ignore the Jaden K. Smith Facebook hoax. And so on the topic of phishing and being aware, uh, this uh, you may have seen this from, from your Facebook folks, and some people have received multiple messages like this, and it says, you know, don't do this. If, you're, if you click this and accept the, the friend request, then you're going to be hacked, and the hoax says, no, you're not. Um, these things are always proliferating with, you know, click here, don't click here. This is going to ruin your life. This is going to give you millions of dollars. So Google it. When in doubt, Google it because probably somebody else has written something about it. And if it sounds pretty fantastical, then, you know, it very well might be. Yep. There you go. So should we get <laughs>
yes, we should. If I'm if I'm still with you, am I am I there? Yeah, you just you just pop back. I pop back. Okay, well, I'll go quickly, and then you can wrap us up. Uh, so my geek of the week, uh, I've got two of them. Uh, one of them is um, an app uh, by uh, Gypsy, I guess. I just closed my screen so let me pop, pop it back up um we as i said went to yellowstone and the tetons uh, this is a great app that works offline or online and it's by it's, it's called a gypsy uh, tour app and it's like you're having your own travel guide in the car with you and as you drive along tells you you know hey there's the history of this and this is signal mountain which you know has the best views of the tetons you really need to check it out and wow it really um you know, just added tremendously to our enjoyment of the trip. And if you've ever been to Yellowstone Park, uh, you know there's a lot of driving. And so it was awesome. Learned all kinds of park history and, and things that we wouldn't have known otherwise. And then the last thing that Alan Levine had actually shared, or I learned from him via Twitter in a conference that he went to uh, in North Carolina, is a, a seven-part web series. I have not watched this yet, but I pro I'm going to. And it's called Do Not Track, a personalized web series about privacy and the web economy important topics for us to consider as we talk about privacy, security, net neutrality, all kinds of aspects of. Nice. Um, and then for this week for my geek of the week, um, and by the way, I related to your comment, please download apps when you travel. There are so many wonderful apps now that can help be guides to you that most of them don't even require internet access. They're super great. Like apps have made traveling like such a richer experience. So, but ignoring that, my geek of the week this week is that uh, as we've discussed in the past, I've gone all in on Google Slides as my presentation technology. Um, I, I sat down and taught myself how to make beautiful, simplistic, presentations and style slides um, on Google Slides. But for those of you that occasionally need a more complex data demonstration slide, which is what I do, and it's the one thing I miss from Microsoft PowerPoint, which has a series of beautiful templates available where you can create uh, data-rich slides that you can use in presentations. There's a great website that is called slidemodel.com. And um, last week, along with my partner in crime, the Digital Academy, Mike Agostinelli, we presented at the Mountain Moot Moodle Conference in fabulous Helena, Montana on our use of H5P, which is an open source uh, digital interactive creator. And we did what we usually did and you know created our, our slides on Google Slides. I need to be able to put a lot of data in a single slide, which I could do pretty easily in PowerPoint, but as it turns out, Slide Model provides beautiful slides um, for exactly that purpose, but in the Google Slides format. There are dozens of them from what I, were able, what I was able to see, and almost immediately I was able to find something that saved me um, hours worth of work um, instead of trying to draw that from scratch in Google Slides. So slidemodel.com, wonderful templates that you can immediately integrate into your Google Slides. And I'll say your Geek of the Week a few months ago, Slide Carnival has changed my life because we've used a lot of templates from it. So phenomenal. And if you haven't made the shift to uh, Google Slides in a cloud-based way of sharing your slides, let this be your moment. Make the change. Yep, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so check that out. And um, such a, it's it, like that. It's been such a game changer for me now that I feel comfortable and 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 proficient in Google Slides. So, Wes, why don't you tell us where we can find you on the internet? I am W Fryer on Twitter, speedofcreativity.org. Uh, Shelly and I publish a little reflective podcast about ISTE and iPad Media Camp from Jackson Lake Lodge before we. We're thinking we were going offline, which we mostly did for a while. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, probably our last show, because it's been a few weeks, uh, did a lot of work with badges and the iPad Media Camp and would encourage people to check out that uh, Twitter channel, iPad Media Camp, as well as the website, because we have a whole list of, uh, well, not list, a whole bunch of <clears throat> iPad, pre uh, what do we call them? Uh, supporting skill badges that we created with with uh, badge list and then also project badges that we used in the iPad media camp and badge list is free and open and you can check all of those things out and yeah check uh, that's that's where I'm at how about you Jason where can people find you these days 
I'm on the Twitters at Tech Savvy Teach. I blog at the NCCE Tech Savvy Teacher blog, blog.ncce.org, where I'm also available for booking as a professional development specialist. And my day job is that I am the assistant director, curriculum director of the Montana Digital Academy, the fabulous state virtual school that is uh, warehoused on the University of Montana campus in the Phyllis J. Washington College of Education and Human Science. Um, EdTech SR is our podcast. We are usually once a week, a little sketchier in the summer time but we get back to our weekly broadcast here soon we broadcast on wednesday nights at 9 p.m central 8 p.m mountain which is the only two time zones that really matter right the middle of america and um we love to have you attend live or have you Download our podcast wherever finer podcasts are aggregated, which means the iTunes podcast library. I use um, uh, Stitcher occasionally to find us. Uh, I have yet to find, um, or I've yet to not find the EdTech SR podcast in any of the major directors of podcasts. So please download and we welcome your feedback. Uh, we're also on Twitter at Ed- EdTech SR, and you can find each week's show notes at edtechsr.com, where you can find all past episodes, YouTube links, and all sorts of interesting bits. So have a great week and we hope to see you soon. Adios. Stay safe.